saw some hands go up as far as the last scenes. Can y'all just help put my hands up? Amen. 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 I just want to give him his just due. Amen. I know he knows that we're thankful. I just, you know, sometimes putting your hands together, amen, is just uh, showing an attitude of, of thankfulness and gratitude. Amen. And I thank God for what he's doing, like Shannon said, in these envelopes. Just thank God for what he has done, you know. And there's a scripture in the Bible that says this. It's in, I believe it's in Psalms 34, and it says this. Oh, magnify the Lord. That's what it says. It says magnify. How many of you know what a magnifying glass is? Raise your hand if you know. Okay. So, a magnifying glass is used for finding something small. It's so that you can see the small thing, right? And so when I say, oh, magnify the Lord, like LaDonna and Alicia were saying, is that sometimes it's small. Sometimes you can't see it. And like LaDonna said, sometimes you have to be like, oh, my gosh, there's only one person. And so and you have to learn to be thankful for the one. You have to learn to be thankful uh, for the one thing in your life. I mean, gosh, I, every time I start talking, I just get moved. Grace maybe. Hello, help. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to tell you a story of my, my, just so that you can get what I'm saying as far as being thankful. I mean, and Shannon knows that if one person shows up here tonight, I am thankful. And I'm going to be so excited and speak as if there's 3,000 because of what happened to me. Now, we were, I was in air traffic control school, okay? And I was born again. I had accepted the Lord, but I wasn't going to church. And, you know, I think I went to my wife's church once or twice, but I wasn't going to church regularly. And so in my air traffic control school, there was this lady, her name was Angie, and she had, uh, she had this book. And it was a notebook. And I said, what is that? She says, oh, I take notes from church. Now, again, I don't know nothing. I'm 23 years old at the time. And I'm like, you take notes from church? From the, she said, oh, yeah, from the Bible, from the preacher. I'm like, what kind of sense does that make? This is what I'm saying, because I don't know. I wasn't a church girl. I didn't know anything about taking notes in church. Hey, I didn't even take notes in school. So, <laughs> so, so why would that be a surprise? And so I'm sitting here, and she says, and, and, and so what happened was she begins to talk to me about it, and there's like five of us. We said, can we see your notes? And she says, sure. And so we were in the corner and reading her notes, and I don't know what they were about, and we, I just thought that was the craziest thing. Now, when the preacher, because I got to say two hours before my wedding, doing wedding counseling, marriage counseling. So two hours before the wedding is when I accepted the Lord and said, Jesus, come into my life. And the preacher told me, I didn't know what it meant. He told me, you're saved. From what? I don't know. He just told me that. And he told me to tell somebody, just like I told some of you. Go tell somebody, right? And so she's talking to me, and she says, well, yeah, I go to church. And I was like, oh, really? And she says, that's not nothing crazy. She says, I'm saved. I was like, me too. I'm <laughs> saved too. You know, because that was the language. And I was like, she was like, really? She said, well, do you go to church? I said, no. She says, I got this church I want you to come to. And, and I was like, really? She said, yeah, this Sunday. And so she gave me the address, and she said, here's the address to the pastor's house, and you can follow him. Okay. So I go, we go to the pastor's house. We follow him to the church, and it's like a thousand-seat church. Okay. And we had even seen some clips of this pastor on television. Okay. But we don't know what happened because we found this out afterwards that something had happened with this pastor that legally he could not step one foot into his pulpit. And he lost his whole congregation. A thousand seat church. So here me and my wife walk into this church and we try to sit kind of like in the middle towards the back, you know? And, and so we sit there and so the pastor, he didn't say anything to us. He didn't warn us. He didn't say, well, guys, well, <laughs> nothing. He just, like normal time. And so he went and 
Then, and he had a guest speaker since he could not speak, so he had a guest speaker. And we're waiting for the people. And nobody's showing. And then there was two people that showed. And so one was on this side of us, and the other was on this side. And when they started the song service, right, they started the song service, and they were passing the tambourine, these two people, back and forth. And me and my wife, we're watching these two people like ping pong. Pass the tambourine back and forth. I wonder where's the rest of the people. And so, anyways, well, you may make a long story short, the guest minister gets up and he speaks as if there is a thousand people in there. He preaches his heart out and he said, and now it's time for an altar call. And there's not much to choose from because I was sitting there stiff as a board, not singing, not doing anything. And the other two people, they seemed joyous and happy, passing the tambourine back and forth. So he really didn't have much to choose from. So he just said, hey, you, gentlemen, you come down here. I, and I had the nerve to say, who, me? Like a roller coaster. <laughs> and he called me down there and he told me, because I was thinking about my best friend who was in my wedding. And he said, you're thinking about somebody like a close, like a brother to you. And I was like, my goodness. And what he was operating in is called the gift of prophecy or word of wisdom, where the Spirit of God reveals things to you and, you and you tell people something to help build their faith. And so, but when he told me that, I was like, how did he know that? And then he started, and he says, your mother's a Christian woman, and she's a godly woman. And I'm thinking, how does he know that about my mother? You know? And then the next thing he says, he says, son, this is my first church service. You're going to be a preacher. And I was, like, <laughs> I was like, now the denomination that we grew up in, in the Baptist denomination that my wife grew up in, the preacher's wives had these big old hats that they wore. Okay? And so, me, when I went home, my wife was like, what did you think about what that preacher said? I was like, yeah, how did he know about Kevin? She was like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I said, Oh, my mother, he had my mother down to a T. That was crazy. She says, no, I'm a preacher thing. Why do you think what he said about you're going to be a preacher? I was like, how? She says, let me just tell you something. I'm not wearing no hat. I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> she says, I'm not wearing no hat. But I was so thankful for that man because he set me on a course that led me here. And it set me on a course, and so I was thankful that that man didn't say, oh my gosh. He said, thank God there's one person here that I can minister to. What about Billy Graham? What about the one person that had to minister to Billy Graham? The one person. And Billy Graham has touched millions of lives across the world. But it took one person to touch Billy Graham's life. Amen. And so the message, the message is to magnify the Lord, to look at that thing small, and you can actually encourage yourself and have a good attitude. I remember one time we had a sales meeting. We're going to get there. <laughs> we had a sales meeting. We had a sales meeting. And the manager, and they were looking to have a great day, but there was a lot of negative things going on this day in the car business. And they said... Well, guys, the owner's going to be here today. So don't nobody mess up, okay? Because if you do that, he's going to be this and he's going to be that. And so, and they were like, and so we just need to. And, you, and they were nervous and they were like, we need to have a great big day. And, and, and at the end of that conversation, he's like, okay, let's go. I raised my hand. And they were like, what? I said, can I talk? And he's like, yeah. I said, I stood before the guys and I said, look. You don't have to be afraid of anybody. I said, you are good salespeople here. And you guys care about the customer. I said, this is about taking care of the customer and treating the customer right. We got a good product. Amen. We have a good dealership and a good service department. And I just changed those things. I said, now you go out there and you take care of the customer. And you work as hard for them, okay, because they need a good deal. And you work hard for them to get a good deal. You show them the right car. And we need to have a good attitude today. And you know, and let's just go out here and let's do it. Everybody got so riled up. We sold like 14 cars, made like $50,000 in one day. I mean, it was amazing. And the next morning, next Monday, me, on Monday, they came in. And the managers knew that the reason that we had a good day was the speech that I gave to the salespeople. It was just changing their focus just a little. Like Alicia said, think on these things. When you find something good, think on that. We can think on the other things. We can, 
But what is it going to produce? Somebody, I, I wrote this, and somebody put it down. It says, worry is the dark room where negatives develop. I'm going to say that slowly. Worry is the dark room where negatives develop. Soon as you start worrying about it, those negatives are starting to develop. <laughs> Me? And, and listen, if I don't do this, I'm real bad at it. Am I real bad at this, honey? See, I'm, listen, what I'm telling you, if I don't think on something positive, you know what I will do? <laughs> listen, I will hire the producers, okay? I will write the script, okay? I will say action, okay? And my brain will go a million <laughs> places in that whole production. And the whole time, the person is like, I just got a flat tire. That's why I didn't call you. Oh, I told them, everybody else, y'all, y'all can go now. We don't, yeah, I mean, I mean, but, but I have, and so I have to think on good things because your mind will wander. Amen? Amen. And so just keep that in mind that this is real stuff and that you have to think on these things because it's important. Amen? Amen. Can everybody have a good Christmas? Yeah. <laughs> well, Merry Christmas to everybody. We're all thinking on good things. Good, good things. Day. Amen. <laughs> I had a great Christmas. My family was here. It was a blessing. Uh, I was um, really blessed, and uh, you know, and it, it, it was just a blessing. So and there's, there's nothing better than family. Amen. <laughs> it just it, it was just a great time with my family and, and the NBA. So, uh, <laughs> I'm a basketball fan, so my wife went to go see a movie that was three hours long. <laughs> so, I got to watch a lot of basketball. <laughs> so, uh, so it was it was good, and so, but you know, actually, actually, Santa can teach us a lot about what we're talking about as far as grace, because it actually will help you understand the system in the Old Testament as far as the law is concerned. Because what does Santa have? He says we have a list of naughty, naughty or nice. nice. Right? And so if you're on the naughty list, you don't get nothing. Isn't that his rule? Mm -hmm. And so you have to be on the nice list. And the parents, boy, they work that system for They're like, hey, you're going to be on the naughty list. The kids straighten up. And it's to what? Control. It is to what? Control. Control. Okay? And that's how it was in the law. If you did right, you were blessed. If you did wrong, you were punished. Okay? And uh, I want to show you God's list. He only has one list. Go with me to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. That's in the New Testament. See, that's man's judgment. But that's not God's judgment, and that's not grace. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, verse 23. <clears throat> I like this list. It's only one list. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What? All. Mother Teresa? All. Billy Graham? All have sinned. This is his list. <clears throat> all have sinned and come short. So his list is what? Say all. all. What does all mean? Everyone. 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 Now, what you have to understand in terms of Adam and Eve, see, if you don't understand our initial state, you don't understand the sinful state. And so you don't understand what we're trying to get back to. See, Adam and Eve, our initial state was not the sinful nature. Okay? Our nature, Adam, was walking with God and talking with God. See, this whole thing, you've got to understand... <clears throat> God wants to have a relationship with us. He's got beings that obey Him. And he, he's got beings that obey His every whim. They're called angels. It 
It's the very reason we have demons because a third of the angels disobeyed God with another angel. His name was Lucifer, who is now Satan. Because they rebelled, they, because they rebelled against God, they did not have the right to disobey God. Whatever God says goes. They did not have the right. So he had that. The angel does not have the right to disobey God. So he has that. He's got a bunch of people or beings that obey him. But that's not why he created us. He created us because he wanted us to have a relationship with him. Amen. 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 And so this is the reason that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, because Adam disobeyed and he actually fell and he created that separation. So sin separates us from God. And a, help, a good way to help you remember sin, S-I-N, selfish in nature. Selfish in nature. What am I trying to say? Selfishness is the problem. Sin did not cause us to be selfish. Selfishness causes you to sin. And see, this is what we have to deal with with our children, is that we say, no, you need to share. And a kid can be playing with eight toys. And a person will be over there with one toy, and he will go over there and take the one toy and bring it up. It's selfishness. It's our nature. It is the sinful nature. And so when I said that I was saved, what I was saved was from my selfish nature. <coughs> and see, when you read, eventually we will get there about the fruits of the Spirit. <coughs> It deals with self-control. A telltale sign that God is in control of your life is that if you have self-control. And so what happens is, this self, see, you may hear people say things like this. Selfishness. I'm talking about selfishness. Because I just said, all, oh, right? Remember that list? But you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't think they're on that list. They don't think they're on that list. It said all, but they're like, no. Nah. And you know what they say? They say, I'm a good person. Raise your hands if you've heard somebody say that. Or have said it yourself. Or have said it yourself. And you say, I'm a good person. And so that's what I call the hope system. You're hoping God will say, that's great. You're a good person. That's all right. You're just a good old person. You know? And, and so, or you've heard people say this, when you may ask them to go to church or you think about going to church, well, when I get my life together, I'm talking about selfishness. When I get my life together, then I'll start going to church. Listen. If you can get yourself together without God, we need to raise a shrine of you and begin to follow you because you got something going on. <laughs> you know, I asked a question one time because I looked at the wealthy, I looked at successful people, and I had this question. And I said, God, I depend on you so much. I said, how do people make it without you? This is my question to God. I'm like, man, my dependence. And see, this is, this is your success in God. See, most people say, well, God is a crutch and this is a crutch. Amen. No, I just increased my dependence on God. That's our relationship. And see, uh, and I'll get to the answer in a second. You know, it's that people... They trust in so many different things. Some people trust in their ability to make money. Some people trust in their education. 
Some people trust in their intellect. Some people trust in their race. Some people trust who they're with. Who they're, I mean, there's all kinds of things that, that, that people trust in. And I'm saying, when I ask God this question, how do people make it without you? He answered me this. They don't. And when God and now listen, I was believing that they did. Because I'm looking at their lives. I'm looking at their success. I'm looking at all these things in their life. And I'm saying, how do they make it without you? And God says, they don't. They don't. I want to show you something to help you with this good person thing. Go with me to Mark chapter 10. Verse number 18. But you have to understand the list. You have to understand that all sin and falling short of the glory of God. If you have to understand that everybody's on that list, no matter how good you are, no matter how small your statue, doesn't matter who you are, everybody's on that list. <clears throat> and when you understand that there's only one list, then you'll understand Jesus Christ and the need for Jesus Christ. Amen? Because if you don't understand this, you won't get grace. Why? Because grace does not deal in the realm of right and wrong. Remember that? It does not deal in the realm of right and wrong. And that's why when God does something, you're like, that's not right. He deals in the realm of life and death. But Mark chapter 10, this is just something fun. There was these people that came to Jesus and they said, and, and Jesus said unto them, okay, Hang on. Go to verse 17. It's not up here. Verse 17 says this. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Verse 18. And Jesus said this. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. Say that with me. There is none good but one. Say it again. There is none good but one. Say it again. There is none good but one. If Jesus won't let himself be called good, and somebody else tells you, I'm a good person, just look at them and say, there's none good but one. And that's God. Amen? Amen. If Jesus won't let him be, see, you've got to understand. He understands the list. And he's like, no, there's none good but one. That's God. So if Jesus won't let himself be called good, do y'all see the selfishness? The self-exaltation? I'm good. I'm good. I mean, the very thing that we need the most, that we depend on the most, Nobody here on earth has control over. That's the sun. Not one person here on earth is in control of the sun. There are scientists that can dictate and say this or that. Nobody puts batteries in there. We ain't got to pay a bill like KG&E. There's no bill. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We ain't got to be worried about getting cut off. Are you following what I'm saying? We're not in as control, much control as we think we are. I told this guy today, I said, I went in his office, and I said, hey, man, it is the beginning of the day. I said, the rest is gravy. He said, what? I said, God woke us up this morning. He blessed us, hey, man. We've got our hands. We've got our feet. We've got breath in our lungs. We're healthy. I said, the rest is gravy. And he just smiled. I mean, he was just lifted up, hey, Amen. So when you wake up in the morning, amen, you got to say the rest is gravy. Amen, because I'm blessed because I'm awake this morning. Amen. Anything else good that happens, amen, is gravy. And I want you to, I want to read something. Go with me to Romans chapter 2. Keep going over. I'm 
trying to get to Romans chapter 2, verse number 4. We are talking about grace. Where are we at on time? Uh, 7.48. 7.48. We're doing good on time because we're going to finish Rahab this week. Amen. And uh, we're going to have a, a, a story. Romans chapter 2. Um, I'm going to read. You don't have to follow. You, those of you who can follow me. I'm going to start with verse number 1. Because, see, grace, what you have to understand about grace, grace will help you to make right judgments. It will, because, I mean, sometimes we make wrong judgments. We look at a person because of the way they look, and we don't, we don't go to them. We don't, we don't go to that person. And then sometimes we, because we think this way of this particular person, you know, now, that, oh, I can go talk to this person. And we make wrong judgments. How many times, let's say in your business, that you thought this person would do great and they didn't. You weren't sure about this person, and this person did better than the person that you thought did great. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And what happens is this. I'm talking about your selfishness. We try to play God. I, mean, I can tell you many times on my job, the guy with the overall, Shannon can tell you as well, the guy with the overall doesn't seem like he's got very much money, can't buy anything, he's got $100,000 cash in his pocket. <laughs> and you're sitting there like, dang, I should have talked to him. But because of my judgment, I was like, oh, I'm going to get a cup of coffee. Uh, this guy needs a professional. Jim, you want to go help him? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so you send that guy out there, and he goes and helps him, and he makes a great commission. All because of our judgment. So I'm trying to tell you about grace. When you understand grace, when you understand the list, okay, when you understand about extending grace, all of a sudden you start making right judgments. All of a sudden, amen, you start feeling better. So I'm going to start with Romans chapter 2, verse number 1. I'm going to read the verse 4. We're going to get to there. And it says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. For when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the same thing. Stop there. She said, do that. You that judge do the same thing. Now listen, just because you're not doing the same thing, it's the same thing. What do I mean? Because he says, all have sinned. See, you may look at that person and say, well, they do this. But see, yours is something different. See, yours may not be, it, it, it may not be way out there. See, what he said, but when you just, now listen, there was a lady in the Bible who was caught in the act of adultery. Now, the adultery wasn't the issue. The issue was that she, they, they brought her to Jesus and said, judge her. They said, judge this lady. This is what they wanted Jesus to do. Now, Jesus, he's walking in grace. He said, I'm, I'm not here to judge her. God is not trying to judge you. I mean, that's selfishness in itself. He said, Don't judge me. I'm not judging you. Amen. I'm not here to judge you. But guess what happened? In the Bible, this lady, Jesus, and there's a crowd gathered around. They're waiting for Jesus to cast judgment on this lady who was caught in adultery. You know what he does? He kneels down. And he starts writing in the sand. Right? Now, as he's writing in the sand, all the people that had stones, because in that day, Adultery, the punishment was death. And so they had stones, and how they did it, they used stones, they didn't have guns, and right then and there, they were all going to throw stones. So they all had stones in their hands, right? And as Jesus is writing in the sand, or writing on the ground, in the dirt, one by one, the people begin to drop their stones and leave. And then Jesus gets up, and he looks at the lady, and he says, where are your accusers? She said, they're all gone. He says, neither do I accuse you. He says, go and sin no more. Your sins are forgiven. Now, this is gospel according to Derek, okay? Because the Bible doesn't say what he was writing down, okay? So, but this is gospel according to Derek. And I believe he started writing their, their sins down with their names on it. Johnny, okay, he did this last night. And Janie, she did this last night. Okay, and LaDonna, she, and all this probably, so now Janie, she's getting out of wind. LaDonna's getting out of it. And so everybody's getting out of it. Oh, your name's down there too. Yeah, you better get going too. And next thing you're gone. Are you following what I'm saying? God is not here to judge us. 
Amen. He came to give us life. And when you understand that, amen, you'll be blessed. Verse number two. And it says, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Talk about those who judge. And thinkest thou this, O man, again, talk about the judgment of man. O man, listen, let me stop right there. How many of us raise our hand has been judged by people? You feel it. You felt it. Amen. Amen. Wrongfully. Amen. Now listen, this is America, and as a black man, okay, as a black man, we were judged wrongly. We bought our house, our first house, me and my wife. We found a neighborhood in College Hill that me and my wife loved. We didn't know this area, so we rented for a couple of years, and we decided we loved College Hill area. And we said, oh my gosh, we love this area, and we bought the house. Took the real Turk maybe a year to find this house for us. And we found, moved into the perfect house. The day that we moved in, the next day we come outside, and on this big fence, excuse me, please, I don't mean to offend, I'm just telling the truth. There was a big sign on the, on the fence, there was a big thing that said, no, and then it had the N crossed. Do you know how me and my family felt that day? Just, they were judging us. They didn't know us. Did they know us? They were judging us. <coughs> and we don't know who did it. But I, I too have felt that. And they had to take that fence down, am I right? Because you couldn't get it out. To get, couldn't get it out? They had to remove the fence. Mm -hmm. It's next door. So grace is important. It really is. It really is. Listen. Uh, verse 4. This is what I'm trying to get to. <clears throat> or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, talking about God, and forbearance or patience, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. The goodness of God, what? Leads to repentance. Amen. That when you show forth the goodness of God, that when you lean, when people are picking on somebody, amen, that you help them. And did you come to their aid and you say, no, 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 no. Can't do that. You know, or you encourage somebody that, that, that probably feels bad. And you know, you know what repentance is? I know we ask for forgiveness, we talk about repentance. You know what repentance is? It's really simple. Repent, let me just break the word down. Re, R-E, like rewind, means to go back. So re is back. So no repentance, people think it's this great, crazy, terrible thing. But it's not. And pent, where is the penthouse at? On a building. The top. The top. So it's two words, re and pent, where they get the word penthouse, which is on the top. And so it's just saying, go back to the, which is God. Because he wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with you. And so, so when, when it says, okay, you need to repent. You need to go back to the top. Because our initial state with God, amen, was not this selfish nature. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, you know what they call Jesus? They call him the last Adam. That's his title. One of his titles is the last Adam. He came to undo what Adam did. And to restore our state with God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I want us to go to Leviticus. <coughs> First of all, no, we're going to go to Rahab. Okay? 
Let's go to Rahab. We're going to finish Rahab today. Okay. Go to Joshua chapter 2. Verse number 18. Okay. Now, I'm going to remind us of the story. This is where the children of Israel shouted and the walls came tumbling down. A gal named Rahab hid the two spies. Okay. And what she said was, she said to them, Hey, because of my kindness, I have a request from you that if... Uh, that you will show us kindness. And so what they said, this is what the requirement that they said, okay, in verse number 18, they said, Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou did let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whatsoever shall go out of the doors of thy house unto the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be within, in, with thee in the house, his blood shall be upon our head, if any hand be upon him. Verse 20. And if thou utter this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath which thou have made to us to swear. Now this scarlet thread, they let him down in the wall with the scarlet thread. That's how, they, that's how they escaped, with the thread out of their window. So they hid them, and so they escaped out of the thread. And they said, hang this thread out the window, so when we come... And we come to take the city. That will be a sign to us. And that thread is a sign of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because it's the red. It's a symbol of grace. It's a symbol of salvation. And so, because it was a requirement. Meaning, in order for her to be saved, there was something that she had to do. And that was hold that thread down. Now, in Joshua chapter 6, you've got to read it if you have time. The whole chapter. It talks about... When they come, when the wall comes down, and I'm telling you, when they get to Rahab's house, that house was packed. I mean, have you ever had a party that was packed? I mean, this house was packed. I mean, uncles, brothers, cousins, nieces, 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 uncles. I mean, this was Arkansas. I mean, in the making. I mean, this place. I mean, they had, that house was packed. I mean, are you hearing what I'm saying? They came, I mean, can you imagine people breaking their necks to try to get into this house? But there was a requirement. Now, I'm going to show you. Go to Leviticus 22. It's an Old Testament scripture. And those of you may have to turn to we'll, we'll show it up here. I'm going to read it up above here. And it says this. You shall offer your own will, a male without blemish, of the bees, of the sheep, or of the goats. But whatsoever that have a blemish, that you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable for you. Now, you're like, I don't know what that said. Me neither. Okay, so, all right. <laughs> They were like, why are you pointing out? Okay. But what I'm trying to point out was this. That in the Old Testament, okay, because sin separated them because of what Adam did. Are you following me so far? What they had to do was they had to get a goat, I mean a lamb or a goat, without blemish. And then they would take it to the priest once a year. Okay? They would take it to the priest, and the priest would inspect the lamb. If the lamb did not have a blemish, then the priest would say a blessing over the person, okay, and their sins would be forgiven, and they have a right relationship with God again. So this was very important. Now, here's what I want you to key in on, is that what were they inspecting? The what? They were inspecting the lamb, not the person. It was the lamb that was being inspected. That's going to make sense here uh, in a second. What's the next scripture we have up there, Shannon? Yeah. Go with me to Luke chapter 7. I'm going to do some reading with here, so don't try to follow up here. I'm just going to, I'm going to read this whole story, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Where are we at on time? 8.02. We have enough time. Amen. <laughs> So we're, we're going to do just good. Luke chapter 7, starting with verse number 36. Okay. And it says, and one of the Pharisees, you guys will love this story. And it says, and one of the Pharisees desired that he, mean Jesus, would eat with him. And he went into, and he, Jesus, went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. She was a what? Sinner. Okay. 
when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, bought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bid him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, talking about Jesus, if he were a prophet, <coughs> remember I was talking about the gift that you know something like with my mother and my friend, amen? What he's pointing to is saying, if this man was a prophet, if this man were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. Now, he, he was like, he should have the prophetic gift, like I shared with the, with the pastor that, that spoke to me, that knew things that I, I was like, how did he know that? He was saying, if he were a true prophet, he would know that this person is a sinner. And he's letting her wipe his feet. Remember what I told you about right and wrong, life and death? See, right there, he was looking at her and he said, this is wrong. That he has, here's a religious man, and he's letting a sinner wash his feet. Jesus perceived this man's thought. Sometimes you don't even have to perceive a person's thought. You can just look at their face. Have you ever seen them? They look. I mean, they're making faces and, you know, with different people that they're uncomfortable with. Sometimes you really don't have to discern nothing. You just look at a person's face. You can tell. It's like, oh, okay. I'm not welcome here. Have y'all ever felt that? Okay. So you follow what I'm saying. So let's read on. Verse 40. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I have someone to say. And he said, Master, say on. He said, There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 pence and the other 50. We'll use 500,000 and 50 dollars. Just so you can get the understanding. So, one owed 500,000 and the other 50 dollars. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Now, hang on. Brother, come up here. You. Come up here. Jane, you come up here. You stand right there. Turn it turn right there. Okay. You stand right there. Okay. All right. Now, listen. Okay. Now, y'all just, let's just, this is just a test. Let's just see how well we do. Okay. Jenny owes me 500000 And brother, give me your first name again. Will. Will. Will owes me $50. You owe me $500,000. And Will owes me fifty. And I come in the room, right, and I say, guys, I'm just in a good room today. Uh, nobody, for whatever it is that you guys owe me, you don't owe me anything anymore. Now, point your fingers at who will shout the loudest. <laughs> she will shout the loudest, huh? Probably him. Probably him. <laughs> Amen. Give him a good hand. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> she would obviously shout the loudest, would she not? She be shouting the rooftops off. Now, hear me out. In uh, verse 42, he says, He forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Is what Jesus asked. Simon answered and said, I suppose he that whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And then, si and then Jesus turned to the lady. He's looking at the lady now. He's looking at the sinner. And he's talking to Simon. Simon's over there. But he's looking at the lady and he's talking to Simon. And he says this. And Jesus turned to the woman and he said unto Simon, See if thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gave no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped, the, wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, have not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou did not anoint. But this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, which what? Are many, are forgiven. For she loveth much, to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. See, you've got to understand what Jesus is wanting. He's wanting a relationship with us. And that person that seemed like this and that, that did this and this bad, he says, you know what? I'm going to get much love from that person. Now I'm going to read on, because this is important. And now the religious people, in verse 49, listen to what they have to say. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, ain't nobody talking out loud. They don't know what to say. <laughs> okay? Who is this that forgives sins also? 
You know what they're asking? This is still Old Testament time. This is not the time when they come. They're looking and saying, where is her lamb? How is this man forgiving sins? She needs a lamb without a blemish. Where is her lamb? How is it that this man is forgiven sins? We have a procedure here. That on the certain time of every year, you bring the lamb without blemish. Go with me to John. One chapter over. One book over. I want you to go. John 129. Actually, <clears throat> This story, John was baptized. And he was, and everybody was asking him, are you the Christ? He's like, no, I'm not the Christ. He said, there's one that's coming after me. That's what John says. There's one that's coming after me. He said, I'm not the Christ. And then the next day, verse 29, said, the next day, John sees Jesus. Jesus is walking towards John. He's walking towards John while he's baptizing. And this is what John says. He says, behold, the Lamb of God which taken away the sin of the world. He said, Behold, what the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Which taketh away the sin of the world. What am I trying to say? Listen. It don't matter what you did. Because guess what? Jesus is what? The Lamb of God. Amen. So, when I'm asking for forgiveness, what is Jesus looking at? What is, what, is what is the God looking at? Is he looking at me? Is he looking at the Lamb? See, Jesus was without blemish. He did not sin. He was sinless. See, you got to get the Old Testament rule down so you can understand who he is. Amen. And so you got to understand that he is a lamb without blemish. And when you go before the priest, amen, you're not the one being inspected. If you've got a lamb that's white as snow and that's without blemish, without spot, without fault. And so when you're asking for forgiveness, sometimes we look at ourselves. See, that's our selfishness. We look at ourselves and we say, oh my gosh, I am so terrible, I'm so awful, I'm so this. No, you've got a lamb. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> you've got a lamb. Do you get that? Yes. That you're not the one being inspected. He says, you've got a lamb. So that means the sins you committed yesterday, the sins you're going to commit tomorrow, Amen. You gotta say, Amen. I got the Lamb of God, and so therefore I can come boldly before the throne of God. What's the next scripture you have for me, Mark? What are you looking for? No, that's not the one. I left my notes at work. I've been preaching without my notes. Oh. Romans. Let me just tell you, y'all don't have to trust me. I don't remember when it is. This is a scripture that says this. It says, where sin abounds, grace, grace abounds much more. Where is that? Romans 520. Okay. Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound. But where sin abound, grace did much more abound. So what? It doesn't matter what you did. Well, See, some people may say, I'm too good. But on the other side, some people say, I'm too bad. You don't know what I've done, Terry. The one lady, her sins were many, were they not? He said, your sin. See, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Amen. See what happened in Connecticut. Amen. That was a very sinful act. Amen. But we don't have to be despondent about that. Do you know why? Because grace abounds much more. 9-11 in the Twin Towers. Grace abounds much more. Yes, we're going to weep. Yes, we're going to mourn when things that are devastating that happen to us. Yes, they're going to hurt. 
But you have to understand what grace abounds much more. It doesn't matter what the enemy does. It doesn't matter what the negatives are in our life. Because why? Because where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. Are, are y'all following that? My last scripture today. Boy, we actually got through something today. <laughs> Romans chapter 12. Is this helping anybody today? I mean, seriously, raise your hand if this is really helping. Yeah. Amen. See, you got to understand, amen, that we have the Lamb of God. No longer do we have to sacrifice the Lamb. No longer. And when you understand it, amen, you get out of self-condemnation. If you kick yourself when you're down, you'll pat yourself on the back when you're up. Some of y'all didn't get that. That is a selfish attitude. What is selfish? And we know people, excuse me, that have a pity party when we have a lamb. Sometimes we just call the wrong person. You can have a pity party, okay, or you can have a praise party. One of the two, just depends on who you call. <coughs> But just so that you can remember the scripture, uh, it's wrong. It's not 1212. That's 1221. I gave you the wrong one. 1221. Did I tell everybody about 1221? 1221. Okay. Well, Romans 1221 is the right scripture, not 1212. Let me tell you what it says. It says. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And we know who good is, don't we? Amen. There's no good, but... So we're talking about God. To overcome evil. Now, just so you guys can get this, why I'm talking about good, there, it's the God kind of good. In the Garden of Eden... They told them not to eat of a certain tree. That tree was the knowledge of good and evil. That was the name of the tree. So when they ate of it, they knew good and evil. And so most people say, oh, the tree was evil. But there was also good on the tree. So this is why we need the Word of God and the Spirit of God not to help us to discern between good and evil. That's simple. But to discern between good and God. See, it may be good. The selfish kind of good. The pleasure feeling type of good. But it's not the God kind of. Because anything that God has, the enemy tries to imitate. To try and deceive. But be not overcome of evil. So what does God want us to do? He wants us to overcome with what? Good. And the good that we have is the Lamb of God. One of the things that Alicia said, I don't know if y'all picked it up, but before anything starts, before the meditation starts, before we even start thinking, it's like cast that thing. Man, you got to start with prayer. What? Start with prayer. Don't try to start thinking. No, start with prayer. Cast that thing upon God. Let your request be made unto God. When that thing hits you and it hurts you, amen, that's the time to, to, to call upon the Lamb of God. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. I mean, I can go to God even if I made the mistake. Oh, that's where the enemy gets us the most. That we think we can't go to God because we're the ones that made the mistake. to go to him the most. That's when his arms are stretched out the most. He's not there to judge us. He's not. He wants a relationship with us. And so things happen. Negative things happen. But don't be overcome with all that that happened. But overcome evil. 
with good. Amen. Amen. See, you can just say, when that person had that devastating thing, that person had this person quit, this person had this, and this all these things happened, this thing happened to this person, and then you can say, hey, let's pray. Because God is what? Good. You know how we all uh, can get real angry and we uh, can say things in anger? Why can't we have the joy as much joyful speaking it out to him when, when things are good? Amen. That's my good friend, Ben. Everybody say, hi, Ben. I invited him today. Amen. Amen. How come we can't? Hold on. Let me get my business card. <laughs> That's not our nature. Just kidding. It's You're all right. Say that one time. It's not in our nature. It's not in our nature. Amen. And so that's why prayer puts us in a different nature, puts us in a spiritual nature. Amen. So that we can walk in this grace because we can't do this alone and that we need. Remember I told you, you increase your dependence on God. Not your dependence on your pastor, not your dependence on your minister. Amen. But your dependence. A pastor's job is to make you independent of them and totally dependent on God. Amen. Amen. And when your dependence is upon him and say, Amen. And how come we can? I want everybody to bow your heads because this is really a testimony. Man, I hope everybody received this message of grace. Grace received. I mean, right now I know it stirred up a lot of emotions in a lot of people. Amen. But first of all, maybe you don't know. Maybe you don't have a relationship with God. Maybe you don't, you don't, you don't know the Lamb of God. Maybe, maybe you're handling your problems on your own. Maybe, maybe you've been trying and, and things have been working and, and, and not working and, and up and down. And you're saying to yourself, you know what? Man, this, this guy's making sense today. I, something in my heart is telling me that this is right. That's the Lord. He's knocking on your heart. Amen. And if you're saying, you know what? I, I need the Lamb of God. I want to make it right with God. I want a relationship with God. If that's you, not trying to embarrass anybody, could you hold your hand?